Before turning um, to the legacy that Mary Shelley bequeaths us, I want first to note Mary Shelley's legacy from her parents. Um, her parents being Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin. And you can see in her name um, the extraordinary legacy that she carries. Her name, her full name, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley. And um, here are her terribly famous parents, Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin. Mary Shelley received an extraordinary education and a very unorthodox education, especially for a girl, that included study of the classics and of the political writings of her mother and her father. Wollstonecraft died from childbirth complications just over a week after Mary was born. So Shelley got to know her mother through her works, especially Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, published in 1792, and she also studied Godwin's Political Justice, published just a year later in 1793. Both of these works, both of these political works of her parents, argue for an intrinsic relationship between politics and morality and for the perfectibility of human nature if we could only develop the right kinds of institutions. And by this they mean educational institutions, familial, legal, and above all, responsible and fair forms of governance governmental institutions. Wollstonecraft was probably best described as a kind of Republican and Godwin was an anarchist, not meaning that he ran around with bombs, but meaning that he was in favour of minimal government interference in the life of citizens. Woman's character, according to Wollstonecraft, is distorted by oppressive customs and laws, and this inevitably affects men too, whose characters and dispositions also develop in negative ways. She argued for a revolution in our manners, or in the way the sexes relate to each other, and Godwin agreed. The worst aspects of human beings arise from bad institutional arrangements. We see these views echoed in Mary Shelley's portrayal of the gradual corruption of the originally benign nature of the creature created by Victor Frankenstein. It's the unfortunate circumstances of his birth his unjust treatment and his painful experiences that turn him into a fiend or a monster. Reform, rebellion and revolution are very much the themes entertained by this family of writers, that is, by Wollstonecraft, <coughs> Godwin and by Mary and Percy Shelley. Hence my choice of this astonishingly uh, powerful opening image of Prometheus. And Prometheus is the exemplar of rebellion. He rebels against the gods. And he's a figure um, that's present in the often forgotten or repressed alternate title of Shelley's novel, the title being Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. So Victor Frankenstein is the modern Prometheus. I'll say more on this shortly. And we see here his ghastly punishment from the gods um, for stealing fire um, and, you know, and giving it to humankind. Uh, for his hubris, uh, he is condemned for, to have an eagle devour his liver, only for that liver to grow back overnight, and so the, the, the punishment's eternal. Percy, Percy Shelley was a great admirer of Godwin, and he um, often uh, visited the Godwin household, and this is how he met Mary. Uh, Godwin didn't exactly approve of their relation, and they actually eventually eloped. On one of their European sojourns, they stayed with the poet, Lord Byron, in Switzerland, near Lake Geneva. Now, I think we really need to remind ourselves that this is a group of young people, like they're really young people. Um, Mary Shelley was only 18, Percy was 24, Mary's half-sister, Claire, who was having an affair with Byron, she was only 18. Byron's doctor was there. He's only 21. And Byron, he's the old man. He's 28 years old. <laughs> so their many discussions included the impressive powers of science. Um, for example, uh, the extraordinary experiments that Lu 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 Luigi Galvani uh, was uh, undertaking where he was animating frog's legs that were, um, had been uh, separated, as you see in these charming images, um, from the rest of their body. Um, and later, uh, probably more famously, but this is after the, um, 
the writing of um, Frankenstein. Um, Ald 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 Aldini Galvani, a nephew of uh, the original Galvani, he infamously animated the head of an executed criminal. So all this raised for these kids on holidays, let's think of it that way, the possibility of bringing the dead back to life. And, you know, this is where galvanic um, uh, batteries come from, come, from, come from Galvani. So it's in this context that they decided on a competition to see who could write the most frightening story. And it's in this context Mary Shelley had a dream or a nightmare, uh, which turned into eventually the novel Frankenstein. So what is our legacy from Shelley's Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus? There's two traditional myths about Prometheus. In one, he steals fire from the gods and gives it to humankind. In the other, he fashions humans from clay. And what Mary Shelley does, she brings together these two stories um, into the one story insofar as her modern Prometheus, Victor Frankenstein, fashions a kind of man from disparate bits of dead bodies and animates the resulting composite with fire, electricity, or what she refers to as the spark of being. Now, I'm sure most of you have read Frankenstein, but I'm going to give you a very bare-bones reminder of the plot. Victor Frankenstein's story unfolds through a series of nested narratives and narrators. It's like, you know, a series of Japanese boxes within boxes within boxes within boxes. Our first narrator, Captain Walton, is an explorer with Promethean ambitions who longs, he says, to tread a land never before imprinted by the foot of man. And what he means by that, by the way, is European man. Um, he's exploring regions um, uh, that have plenty of indigenous people. Uh, so, and he dreams, he says, of the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind by finding a route through the North Pole, which would, you know, be uh, extraordinary for trade, or, he says, by discovering the secret of the magnet. So, you know, no small ambitions. Now, Walton encounters an exhausted Frankenstein who's been pursuing his monstrous creation through the icy north by dog sled in order to destroy him. Frankenstein relates his life story to Walton, who records it, along with his own reactions to this story, through retelling the story in letters to his sister, Walton's sister. And within Frankenstein's narrative nests an account of the creation of his creature and of his meeting with him after their extended separation. And it's during this meeting that the creature tells his life story to Frankenstein, which Frankenstein in turn relates to Walton. And finally, after the death of Frankenstein, Walton meets the creature face to face and so closes the narrative with a direct report of the creature's own version of events. And this device of nested narratives involves the reader in the multiple affective worlds and viewpoints of the various characters. And almost all of the plot movement is driven by very strong emotion, ambition, fear, hatred, envy and revenge. Frankenstein relates from a very early age he wished to distinguish himself, so it's his Promethean hubris. He sought, he says, the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life. He leaves his home in Geneva to attend university in Ingolstadt, where he studies natural philosophy and chemistry. Frankenstein spends several years studying anatomy, dissection, physiology, and he tells Walton, I quote, after incredible labour and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay, more, I became capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. Dizzy with success, he resolves, he says, to give life to an animal as complex and wonderful as man. But because the minuteness of the parts in, in human beings formed a great hindrance to my speed, he says, I resolved to make the being of gigantic stature. Eight feet tall, in fact. So aspiring to these Promethean heights, Frankenstein dreams that a new species, he says, would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. 
And I'm not going to talk at all about the feminist critique of, um, of Frankenstein, uh, but obviously, he's why would these children be especially grateful to him like no other father? Well, because there's no mother. So he's usurped, you know, the, the mother's role um, entirely. It's a very interesting um, uh, way to think about um, Frankenstein, and I, 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 it's going to come up in the panel this afternoon, but it's not something that I'm going to talk about here. So he says, no father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. But we know things go horribly wrong. And once the creature becomes animate, Frankenstein regards it with what is described as breathless horror and disgust. I'm quoting. Here's, here's Boris Karloff for you to think about. I'm quoting from Frankenstein. I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. His eyes, if eyes they could be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened and he muttered some inarticulate sounds while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He refers to the creature as a demoniacal corpse and he says, I had gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then. But when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion, it became a thing such as even Dante could not have conceived. Now, um, hardly presenting us with a model of responsible parenthood, Frankenstein flees the fruit of his long labour. <coughs> He leaves Ingolstadt and doesn't encounter his creature for the next few years. Meanwhile, what's become of the nameless composite that Frankenstein created but failed to name or nurture? Although born fully grown, Frankenstein's abandoned creature is nevertheless as needy as a newborn babe. And it's worth noting here, um, at the close of the novel, the creature's only seven years old. So, you know, he, he's, grown, he's born full grown, but, you know, he's, he's a babe. And his account of his first months of his life, this abandoned life, um, which he passed in the forest near Ingolstadt, is, it's poignant. He says he felt cold, alone, helpless, hungry, thirsty and frightened. A very brief chronology of the creature's encounters with others include, first, with his own maker, who we see responds to him with disgusted horror and abandons him. Second, he encounters a shepherd who shrieks and runs away. Third, on entering a village, people scream, faint and throw stones at him. And in the years during which Frankenstein um, has no contact with his creature, the creature learns to speak and read through a device that's a bit clunky, I must admit, in the novel, um, through observing the de Lacy family. And this is a family of cottagers, um, and he takes up uh, refuge in a hovel, which is uh, like a lean-to to their cottage, and he observes them through a crack um, in the wall. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit stretching the imagination. But this is his fourth and most drawn-out encounter with humanity, uh, but it's a one-way relation. He, he very much fantasises he's part of their family, but they are unaware of him. But he, he comes to love that family, the de Lacy family, and he longs for and hopes for a reciprocal relationship with them. And in some ways, this is his nursery time. You know, what he learns here is not only speech and writing, um, but also about human families, about human affections and sympathies and human history. But his hopes for a reciprocal relationship are shattered when this longed-for meeting ends with various family members, again, fainting, running away, beating him with sticks and so on. And it's after the bleak conclusion of his time with them that he swears to wage, I quote, everlasting war against the human species. However, even in this understandably really bitter state of mind, the creature is nevertheless subsequently moved to save a child who's drowning in a river. And his reward is that he is shot and wounded by his father, by her father, sorry. Now, these brutal encounters provide the creature with profoundly upsetting responses to the existential questions he poses to himself. And I'm quoting, you know, these are the questions every being at some point must pose to themselves. Who was I? What was I? Whence did I come? What was my destination? 
And we know he has no name, no mother, no father, no friends, no money, no property, and no legal status. And he says, I'm quoting, I was not even of the same nature as man. Was I then a monster, a blot on the earth from which all men fled and whom all men disowned? The creature's realisation that although he identifies and sympathises with humankind, humankind does not identify or sympathise with him is heart-wrenching. The creature recalls his happier times with the de Lacy's thus, I quote, the gentle manners and beauty of the cottagers greatly endeared them to me. When they were unhappy, I felt depressed. When they rejoiced, I sympathised in their joys. But there's no reciprocity so far as his sympathetic affections are concerned. The creature invariably produces a response of fear and revulsion in those who see him, and the contagion of affect operates only to produce these ghastly spirals of hatred, fear and envy that generate more revenge for revenge already taken. And what the creature longs for is friendship, sympathetic fellowship and a community in which to pursue his well-being. Instead, what he comes to see, and I'm going to come back to this um, phrase of his, it's an important phrase, what he comes to see, and I'm quoting from him, he says, the human senses present insurmountable barriers to our union. After he's learned to read through this device of, you know, looking through the crack in the wall, the creature rather conveniently again finds three books in the, for in the forest. And these three books are Milton's, Paradise Lost, <laughs> Goethe's Sorrows of Werther and Plutarch's Lives. Through his study of these canonical, canonical works of Western civilization, he comes to a view about human nature. He says, I quote, I found myself similar, yet at the same time, strangely unlike to the beings concerning whom I read. About Paradise Lost, he says that at first he read it as a true history, again noting some similarities with his own condition. He says, like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence, but Adam comes forth from the hands of God a perfect creature, happy and prosperous, guarded by the special care of his creator, but I was wretched, helpless and alone. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my condition, for often, like him, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. But when he comes to realise that the books he's happened upon are not histories but fictions, he finds his own situation even more intolerable. And it's, I think it's interesting that Mary Shelley uses some lines from Book 10 um, of Milton's Paradise Lost as the epigraph to her novel. And these lines are... Um, the question, questions that Adam puts to God in Paradise Lost. Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mould me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? And the creature's complaint to Frankenstein resonates with Adam's lament to God. He says, a cursed creator, why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turn from me in disgust? Cursed, cursed creator, why did I live? So he may have begun his life as a kind of innocent Adam, but the creature moves beyond that worldview. Um, and he displays uh, not just anger, but extraordinary moments of acute insight and rationality. For example, when he offers Frankenstein compelling arguments for why he, Frankenstein, has duties towards the being that he's created. He says to him, I quote, you're in the wrong. And instead of threatening, I am content to reason with you. And this elicits um, the reflection from Frankenstein. I'm quoting, for the first time I felt what the duties of a creator towards his creatures were. But this is a very, very short-lived revelation. It's the creature who understands the responsibility one has for the beings one brings into the world and for the consequences of one's actions. Through the creature's narrative, we come to see how his mind, soul has developed and how it becomes distorted through his context and through the reactions that others have to his form of embodiment. These affective responses of others bind the creature to the destructive emotions that lead to vindictive acts, such as the murder of Frankenstein's little brother, William. 
Frankenstein's best friend, Clerval, and finally Frankenstein's wife, Elizabeth. But it's not only the creature's passions that drive the tragedy. Frankenstein too becomes progressively deranged, murderous and isolated from his fellows. On his view, the creature is a monstrous failure that does not at all fulfil the dream he had of creating a new species with a happy and excellent nature. Frankenstein and his demon, as he comes to call him, progressively come to mirror each other's destructive emotions and actions. After the creature has murdered little William, Frankenstein says, I quote, I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind and endowed with the will and power to effect purposes of horror, such as the deed which he had now done, murdering William, nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit let loose from the grave and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. And later he echoes those words of the creature um, when Frankenstein's own isolation reveals to him the presence, he says, of an insurmountable barrier placed between me and my fellow men. Now, it's telling, I think, that when most people hear the name Frankenstein, they don't think of the scientist, the proper referent, Dr Frankenstein, they think of the monster, so-called monster. So the nameless creature does receive a name, um, a patronym, in fact, only in the afterlife of the novel, when he and his maker become indistinguishable. And we see the full force, I think, of this affective doubling, sort of doppelganger effect. The creature's only hope, I love this so much, and to see it in situ, it brings tears to your eyes, I think. Um, the creature's only hope for happiness is to find another being similar enough to him to allow fellow feeling to develop. He longs for sympathetic companionship rather than the continuation of the web of evil and destructive emotions that he's caught in. And in the context of asking Frankenstein to, to, to make, make him an Eve, he says, if any being felt emotions of benevolence toward me, I should return them un an hundred and an hundredfold. For that one creature's sake, I would make peace with the whole kind. And, and initially, Frankenstein agrees to, to make him a mate. Um, but fearing what two monstrous beings, once united, could achieve, Frankenstein reneges on this agreement and he rips to pieces the female body he'd been composing. And Frankenstein, uh, the, sorry, Frankenstein's creature witnesses this and it's what triggers, it's, you know, uh, um, uh, this life and death struggle that Walton first encounters the two figures in. You know, Frankenstein chasing his creation on... Um, uh, dog-drawn sleds through this Arctic north. And, and Frankenstein, by the way, has hypothermia. He's near death when he meets Walton, and indeed he does die there. The various literary um, and scientific materials which Shelley draws on are enormously rich, and I, can't, I really can't do justice to them today. But what's emerged already in the description of the plot is that Shelley is in conversation with Milton's Paradise Lost, with the various Prometheus myths, um, and with Galvani's electrical experiments. So in a sense, she's putting, like um, Patricia Piccinini, I think, she's putting um, politics, myth, and science into conversation, um, even, in a sense, into competition with each other. But I think one also needs to take stock if we're going to get um, to the uh, root of this uh, importance of the sympathetic imagination. We need to take stock of some other um, sources that she engages, and in particular I'm thinking of the Scottish sentimentalists, so I'm thinking of people like um, Hutchison, Hume and Smith, and I just want to very, very briefly um, talk about them and, and bring them into um, the conversation that I think Piccinini's work um, uh, puts us right in the middle of this kind of conversation. The Scottish sentimentalists argue that sympathy grounds moral community. And um, just let me try and fill this out a little bit. Leading up to the murder of William, the creature wonders if a child, that is, someone not yet prejudiced by society, might not come to love him if he treated it well. 
And this is what he thinks when he comes across young William, who's much, much younger than Dr Frankenstein. But William makes very clear his reaction to the creature's appearance. Let me go, monster, ugly wretch, ogre. Now, William is also well aware of his privileged class status. He says, my papa is a syndic. He will punish you. Now, I think Shelley's raising a number of questions for her readers to ponder in the context of the sympathetic imagination and sympathetic identification. She challenges the common association, as does Piccinini, between beauty, truth and goodness. Can, one char can, can one's character be read off from one's face? Can we sympathise only with those who are pleasing to our sight or who we judge to be similar to us? And um, this is a, an idea that goes back um, to Aristotle. Um, in his work, Physiognomy, Aristotle says, I'm quoting, the face, when fleshy, indicates laziness. If gaunt, assiduity. If bony, cowardice. A small face marks a small soul, as in the cat and the ape. A large face means lethargy, as in asses and cattle. And uh, Johann um, Lavater agrees with this. He says, if you would know men's hearts, look in their faces. And, you know, this uh, chart gives you the four types, you know, four character types. Um, the shape of the face re reveals, you know, are you a, a phlegmatic, choleric, sanguine or melancholic type? Now, how anybody could <laughs> would want to recognise themselves in <laughs> any of those images is beyond me. Um, GF, uh, GWF Hegel says, through the eyes we look into a man's soul. A man's glance is what is most full of his soul, the concentration of his inmost personality and feeling. And that, that's from the aesthetics. Now, recall here that when Walton meets Frankenstein, he's longing for a friend. Walton's longing for a friend. And what he says is he has a desire for a friend whose eyes would reply to mine. Um, and compare that to Frankenstein's description of his creature's eyes, the dull yellow eye, he says. And more famously, I suppose, Wittgenstein says, this is in Philosophical Investigations, the human body is the best picture of the human soul. What do we know about the appearance of the creature? I'm quote from Frankenstein's own assessment of his creation. His limbs were in proportion and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful? Great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips, the dull yellow eye. So what's the problem here? Um, is the problem one of miscegenation? Um, and that's from the Latin, meaning to mix genuses, you know, to, to mix things together, mix kinds, mix things together that shouldn't be mixed together. Does the creature's appearance condemn him to hatred and antipathy? And is such antipathy a causal factor in the destroyer that he becomes? Does human sympathy extend only to human forms? And if so, what are our responsibilities towards those who significantly differ from us? Remember Walton's report to the reader when the creature appeals to him to hear his side of the story. Walton says, I shut my eyes involuntarily and endeavoured to recollect what were my duties with regard to this destroyer. I called on him to stay. In other words, he agrees to listen to his story, but only if he shuts his eyes. And that's why I say, remember what the creature says. The human senses are insurmountable barriers to our union. Okay, what is it that Hutchison and Hume bring to the table? You know, why do I think that it's worth thinking about these, 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 uh, these philosophers in this context? Well, think of Hutchison. He, he asks the question, what is this secret chain between each person and humankind? And he asks, how is my interest connected with the most distant parts of humankind? How can I love and feel compassion and indignation and hatred even toward fictional characters, feigned characters in the most distant ages and nations, according as they appear kind, faithful, compassionate, or of the opposite dispositions, 
toward their imaginary contemporaries. And Hume, very famous quote, the minds of men are mirrors to one another, not only because they reflect each other's emotions, but also because those rays of passions, sentiments and opinions may be often reverberated and may decay away by insensible degrees. So it's a kind of, he's suggesting there's a kind of maze of mirrors, you know, where we keep, we, we keep um, our, our, our affects reverberate back and forth. And there's a contemporary version of this um, theory of the contagion of affect um, that was put forward um, by Ekman and um, Friesen here. You, you might be familiar with it. It's so, the so-called facial action coding system. Um, and what this, what this system is um, meant to explain is that, um, or show, sorry, it doesn't explain, it shows um, that uh, human beings automatically um, sympathise, uh, empathise with what those we judge who are like us with what they're feeling. So um, I hope you don't flunk any of these um, <laughs> because your humanity is going to be in question if you do. Um, so going on the top, left to right first, she's angry, he's frightened, she's disgusted, um, she's surprised, he's happy and she's sad. Um, and the idea with, the, with this is that it, this is hardwired. It's universal, it's ahistorical, you go to other cultures and you show them these pictures and... Um, uh, I mean, this, this is contested by various people, uh, but, you know, the idea is that this um, capacity that we have uh, to feel what the other's feeling, it's, it's, it's a power to mind read, in a sense, um, is innate and cross-cultural. Um, OK, I touched my... Um, didn't mean to do that. OK, good. Uh, and as you know, um, some people have hypothesised, and I really think it is hypothesised, mirror neurons um, in the brain to account for this kind of phenomenon as well. Uh, and it suggests that we've evolved in ways that make us essentially sociable and, and relational. So perhaps Hume was right uh, when he echoes the sentiment of our Frankenstein creature um, when he says... Every pleasure languishes when enjoyed apart from company and every pain becomes more cruel and intolerable. Whatever other passions we may be actuated by, pride, ambition, avarice, curiosity, revenge or lust, the soul or animating principle of them all is sympathy. Nor would they have any force were we to abstract entirely from the thoughts and sentiments of others. Let all the powers and elements of nature conspire to obey one man, let the sun rise and set at his command. The sea and rivers roll as he pleases and the earth furnish spontaneously whatever may be useful or agreeable to him. He will still be miserable till you give him some one person at least with whom he may share his happiness and whose esteem and friendship he may enjoy. And I think this is partly what's so poignant about Piccinini's couple. But we've got a problem. The Scottish sentimentalist account runs up against serious criticism insofar as it seems that we feel most sympathy for those who are most close and dear to us um, and in what's called um, in the literature the concentric circle problem. Um, as people become more and more remote from us, we care about them less and less. So my family, my kin, my neighbour, um, my country, country folk, um, my e ethnic group and so on until um, these, uh, the outer uh, circles uh, just, just fade away. Now my question is, is this hardwired or learned? And even if it's hardwired, can it be changed? Can our sympathetic imagination be educated? And some argue, I'd be one of them, uh, that music, literature, painting, sculpture has the power precisely to do this, to challenge and transform how we see what we see, to imbue sight with value and feeling 
and to challenge the idea that the scientific gaze offers the only true grasp of the world. And I'm going to come back to that idea shortly. So obviously, th these are really important questions um, uh, for, for Frankenstein's creature. Is sympathy reserved only for one's own kind? Um, are we species narcissists? Um, now, the creature tells us that his image terrified even him. I'm quoting, I viewed myself in a transparent pool. At first I started back, unable to believe that it was indeed I who was reflected in the mirror. And when I became fully convinced that I was in reality the monster that I am, horrible phrase, I was in reality the monster that I am, I was filled with the bitterest sensations of despondence and mortification. Now, isn't this pretty powerful evidence that he's just objectively ugly? <laughs> I mean, you know, if he's ugly even to himself, then, you know, isn't there a kind of objectivity involved in this? Well, I don't think so. And I don't think so because I think the scene begs the question of the creature's singularity. If we act as mirrors for each other, then radical difference, a unique being, may well be perceived in terms of deformity even by itself. We know from experience and from history that, se that even sexual and racial difference are often uh, seen in terms of deformity. Aristotle, for example, thought women were deformed men. That's his explanation for why, what, for, for, for women, for why women exist. They're, they're deformations of the perfect type man. Race and ethnicity are often experienced in terms of lack and inferiority, both by the oppressor and by the oppressed. Can otherness be represented positively? Are monsters always constructions from a specific viewpoint? Now, look, I reckon Robert De Niro doesn't look so bad. <laughs> All things considered, um, he hardly meets the description we're offered of the creature. I'll, I'll give you this, the description. No mortal could support the horror of that countenance. Never did I behold a vision so horrible as his face of such loathsome yet appalling hideousness. I dared not again raise my eyes to his face. There was something so scaring and unearthly in his ugliness. But, you know, this is the sense of sight. But old man de Lacey, Frankenstein and Walton all can talk... Sorry, the old man de Lacey is blind, by the way. He's the only de Lacey who was kind to the creature. Old man de Lacey, Frankenstein and Walton can tolerate the voice of the creature. So provided they don't see his face, then they feel compassion for him. So, you know, physiognomy here seems to be translating into moral worth, beauty um, and goodness. They're all collapsed into each other. Uh, and the, this physiognomy also clearly correlates with class and with race and with ethnicity. Frankenstein's creature has to learn not only that he's ugly and so bad, but he's also poor, he's nationless, and he's a different species to everyone else. Indeed, he may even be non-human, because recall Frankenstein tells us that some of the body parts were acquired in the slaughterhouse. Uh, that, that means parts of his creature may well be animal. He does not belong anywhere in this world. He, he has no landscape to hold him. Now, when the young Arabian woman, Safi, moves in with the de Lacy's and she's being taught to read and speak their language, in short, she's being taught to assimilate the values of Christian society, the creature through the crack in the wall is also learning why he is not going to be assimilated, why he can't be assimilated, why he will always be excluded from society. And um, the, note the year of publication of this, uh, this text, which um, Shelley refers to, which uh, was, was an important text at the times, Volney's Ruin, The Ruins of Empires, 1791, so it's the year before the French Revolution. And what this um, text uh, that Safi's being taught from tells uh, is, is world history, uh, tells about different religions, origin of tyranny, oppression, and it posits a future. Uh, where the world is governed according to the principles of liberty, liberty equality and fraternity. Um, but what does the creature learn from this text? Just let me briefly... Uh, I'm, I'm finishing up, by the way. Just let me briefly quote. Through this work, I obtained a cursory knowledge of history and a view of the several empires at present existing in the world. 
And this, I think this image is perfect for what he learns from Valdi. Um, it gave me an insight into the manners, governments and religions of the various nations of the earth. I heard of the slothful Asiatics, of the stupendous genius and mental activity of the Grecians. I heard of the discovery of the American hemisphere and wept with Safi over the hapless fate of its original inhabitants. Was man indeed at once so powerful, so virtuous and magnificent, yet so vicious and base? I heard of the division of property, of immense wealth and squalid poverty, of rank, descent and noble blood. I learned that the possessions most esteemed by your fellow creatures were high and unsullied descent united with riches. And what was I? Of my creation and creator, I was absolutely ignorant. But I knew I possessed no money, no friends, no kind of property. I was beside endued with a figure hideously deformed and loathsome. Was I then a monster, a blot upon the earth from which all men fled and whom all men disowned? What was I? Well, our creature is a unique being and his creator, Frankenstein, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, but isn't something missing here? I, I, I mentioned this nested narration, right? You know, within Walton's narration, you've got Frankenstein's and you've got the creatures. What's happened to the author? What's happened to the author? Isn't Frankenstein also a creation? Like, isn't there a narrator above um, Frankenstein? Isn't he a creation from the imagination of Mary Shelley? So, isn't our motherless creature ultimately her responsibility? <laughs> Aren't artists like gods? Um, are the imaginary beings and worlds they create real? Can works of art be ethical, unethical? Should artists be held responsible for their creations? I'm going to skip one, sorry. Should artists be responsible for their creations and for the antipathy or sympathy they elicit? Um, and this debate, uh, obviously, around Leni Riefenstahl's uh, work and her images of human perfection and what role these images played in Hitler's um, ideology of um, Aryanism. Like, what, how, how, to what degree should we hold her responsible for those? Well, I venture that Mary Shelley's laboratory, which is her novel, allows room for an ethical relation to develop between the reader and Frankenstein's creation. The moral failing in the novel centres on Victor Frankenstein's hubris, even though he comes to refer to the setting for his creative experiment as his filthy laboratory. That's what he calls it, his filthy laboratory. Art involves an experiment, an act of creation, a leap of faith into an unknown future. But some artists view these powers of innovation as involving responsibility. And this is how I want to briefly, very briefly relate Patricia Piccinini's exhibition to Shelley's novel. And I would say that Piccinini's creations are nurtured they're given a home, they're given a context, and they're given a landscape in which they can belong. Her creatures are often represented as, as vulnerable, caring, loving, bonded, and as inviting interaction and connection. Her work elicits a loving gaze from the viewer. However, it is not an unambivalent gaze, as the wonderfully apt title of this spectacular retrospective suggests. Curious, affection. Her works are curious in at least two senses. They're odd, strange and unusual, but also they arouse curiosity. Her creatures seem to have agency. They're, they seem inquisitive, playful, and some of her beings return the viewer's gaze with a quizzical look, as if to say, well, what are you looking at? You know, you're looking at me, I'm looking at you. The work is concerned with affect and affection in equally complex ways. The work affects the viewer in the sense that Piccinini's beings disturb and unsettle, sometimes repel. They challenge and shock our perceptions of the borderline between human and animal, natural and artificial, human and post-human. But these hybrid forms of life also embody affection in the sense of affectionate ways of interacting with each other, snuggling, holding, supporting and nurturing. So, curious affection, indeed, 
Um, the works provoke what some have called entangled looking or entangled empathy, as opposed to a scientific or objectifying look. And those who've seen the exhibition would know that Piccinini has her own laboratory. And it's not a space of isolation, but a working space with others with whom she's in various kinds of kinship relations. It's not only her artworks that are always in relation, they're also produced and sustained in relation. Not a filthy laboratory then, I, 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 I say, but an ethical one. And I found the film about her studio, which is part of the current exhibition, absolutely fascinating and a stark contrast to what Frankenstein says about the scene of his creation, of his work. When describing his state of mind while making his creature, he says the work, I quote, was unlike an artist occupied by his favourite employment and more like a slave toiling in the mines. And he describes himself, I quote again, as being oppressed by a slow fever and nervous to a most painful degree. The fall of a leaf startled me and I shunned my fellow creatures as if I had been guilty of a crime. During this period of his creation, Frankenstein totally isolates himself from his family and from his kin. But isn't it true, nonetheless, that it was Shelley who created a being who was shunned by all. Indeed, two spurned beings. First, the so-called monster and then Frankenstein, who becomes progressively monstrous. And Piccinini too, sorry, these are slightly out of order, Piccinini too might be accused of creating deformed, repugnant beings who are doomed to a freak show kind of existence. Now, if the sentimentalists, the mirror neuron folks are right, and we are hardwired to reject those who are unlike us, then the empathic gaze and concern Piccinini hopes to cultivate might be impossible. I find this one of the strongest challenges, the legacy, if you like, that's the title of my lecture, The Legacy of Mary Shelley. Um, I find this one of the strongest challenges to Mary Shelley's legacy, and I think it's also a challenge to Piccinini's work. Frankenstein's creature says, the, humans, the human senses present an insurmountable obstacle to the formation of kinship, community. But I've suggested to you that how one sees is not quite so straightforward. Seeing's not just a matter of simple perception, but may involve an imaginative act of seeing as. Seeing a worm burrowed in between the petals of a rose as the flawed human condition involves a special kind of affective, thinking, seeing, seeing, thinking. Rightly engaged, the sympathetic imagination arguably alters how we see what it is that we see. And perhaps it's in this seeing as not just a sort of passive seeing, but seeing as that the power of art lies. And this is what lends art its inescapable ethical or moral dimension. Aesthetic creations are necessarily also ethical posits insofar as they command our attention, arouse our curiosity and engage our affects. But what about the concentric circle problem? You might think I'm just conveniently forgetting that. Our tendency to care less and less about others as the ripples of affect diminish and fade as they fan out away from our centre. Well, I think art can also get us to attend to the distant by getting us to look again, this time with focus and care. But how does this work and what might be the role of sympathy in this looking? Now, I'm going to finish with... Um, uh, 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 the reflections of a contemporary writer who, who I think has really struggled with this question and who's helped me struggle with the question. And this is the writer, um, J.M. Coetzee. Uh, and especially I think he struggles with it in his novel, Elizabeth Costello. What he does in that novel is critically engage with the power and limits of sympathy and its capacity to ground moral action. And he has the protagonist, that is Elizabeth Costello, declare there are no bounds to the sympathetic imagination. Now, if this is the case, then different beings can come to form moral communities with each other. 
And what Costello holds, and I'm quoting here, she says, the heart is the seat of a faculty, sympathy, that allows us to share at times the being of another. Sympathy has everything to do with the subject and little to do with the object. Most people possess this faculty to varying degrees and to be deficient in the capacity makes one cruel and selfish, but to lack it completely is to be a psychopath. But Frankenstein's creature is not a psychopath. He suffers greatly from the manner in which he is or is not connected to others. It's Frankenstein who fails to care and who's mesmerised by his own narcissism. The cold, arrogant rationality of the scientist is the human problem, part of what is involved in our many present ethical failings in relation to different others, including animals. Art can convince us of truths that reason can't prove. For example, the importance of context, connection and affect to achieving a cognitive grasp of the human condition is pertinent to Costello's response when she's pushed to explain the responsibility of the artist. She explains it like this. She says, evil can jump, I'm quoting, like an electric shock from person to person and from writer to reader. It's not something that can be demonstrated. It's something that can only be experienced. That's the end of the quote. The vulnerability of life, all forms of life, and the fragility of care and goodness is also most often felt rather than objectively known. Kutzia's narrative reveals how good and bad affects circulate, how they jump from you to me and back again in a ceaselessly circulating economy of affect. This is how Dr Frankenstein and his creation come to mirror each other's emotions and affections. The spark that animates Frankenstein's creature continues to pass back and forth between them, carrying circuits of affect. Affect is contagious, and this puts a special responsibility on the shoulders of the artist-writer. Who or what has the artist brought into existence? What feelings does her creation elicit? What changes in human reality will be brought about through the spark of being that jumps from Pacini's creatures into you and into me? What kind of new curious affections will be born? Thank you.